why don't we begin with Habakkuk from today, the prophet, and listen to the words he says. How long, O Lord? I cry for help, but you do not listen. I cry out to you violence, but you do not intervene. Why do you let me see ruin? Why must I look at misery? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and clamorous discord. Can you believe a prophet is talking to God like that? Can you believe a prophet would dare to question the God of the Old Testament? But this isn't the first prophet to do it, and it ain't going to be the last either. He asks him a very human question. It's really a question of, you know, pain in the world. How can we justify evil in the world if there's a good God? And so the Lord answers him and he says this. Write down the vision clearly upon the tablets so that one can read it readily. In other words, make it simple to read. Don't use 8th grade vocabulary. Don't write in some kind of ancient rooms or as small as Father Wayne writes when he does. Write so everybody can see, everybody can understand, and so that it's simple. Because how are they going to follow what I say if they can't understand it? He goes on to say, for the vision still has its time. Presses on to fulfillment and will not disappoint. If it delays, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not be late. You can almost see a smile on our Lord's face as he's saying this. Relax. I'm God. If I don't like it, I can change it. As if God could come late, or as if his timing is off, or as if his plan is not perfect. We join the prophet as we ask these questions. God's time is always the right time. If it delays, wait for it. It will surely come, it will not be late. And so I think sometimes we get scared because God can seem like a contradiction. He really can. What does he want us to do? And we're confused. Does he want us to judge or does he want us to show mercy? And I, I think this is why Jesus gave that one parable about the talents. And the master in that parable says, you knew that I reaped where I did not sow and that I harvested where I did not plant. He's a bit of a contradiction, but God can't be a contradiction because it, he's all powerful. So if it seems like he's a contradiction, he just changes it. And so what is it? It's hard for us to understand. So we're in the same boat as Abba. We're trying to understand, even in this world, in this day and age, why all these evils are allowed to occur in a world that is seemingly ruled by this all-knowing and all-powerful God. And so it begs the question. God speaks through Ezekiel the prophet and says, if you see someone who is not living their life like they should, then you have an obligation to tell them. And if they don't listen to you, if they go on and live their life the way they wanted to, then they will die in their sin, but you're no longer responsible for that. But if you don't warn them, and they die, then they have died in their sin, but you are condemned for it. I mean, how are we supposed to take that? And then Jesus says, be merciful. So what are we supposed to do? Well, as our Christian brothers and sisters would do, we turn to St. Paul, because St. Paul is the authority par excellence on this. St. Paul says to Timothy, I remind you to stir into flame the gift of God that you have through the imposition of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather of power and love and self-control. Not a spirit of cowardice, but of power and love and self-control. And so this spirit is a spirit of power and the fruits of the Holy Spirit are love and self-control. 
And so there we have it. And so he's reminding us, stir into flame the gift that God gave you. But he goes on to say, do not be ashamed of your testimony to our Lord, nor of me, a prisoner for his sake. But bear your share of hardship for the gospel. Guard this rich trust with the help of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. So now it seems like he's contradicting himself again. He's saying, show the power of the Holy Spirit with love and self-control. But, by all means, guard the sacred deposit of faith that we have. In other words, keep the rules. We have to judge between what's right and wrong, but use the power of the Spirit that yields the fruits of love and self-restraint. So if we're supposed to do these things, we ask the question again, what is it? Am I supposed to judge or am I supposed to be merciful? The answer is both and. Both and. We need to guard that sacred deposit of faith. We need to judge what is right and what is wrong. If God did not want us to judge what's right and what's wrong, then one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit would not be right judgment. And so we are called to judge what is right and wrong. We are not called to condemn. And we have to be very, very careful there. Because we can come to believe that the two are the same thing, and they're not. Jesus will say in the Gospel in another place, I came to save the sick, not the self-righteous. Righteousness is not something we can ascribe to ourselves. That word diakasune in the Greek was only something that a judge could give. A judge could say you're righteous. It has to come from someone else. And so judges back then were righteous because they were appointed by the people and they deemed them as such. If I say that I am righteous, then I'm not righteous, I'm self-righteous. And so we cannot condemn. That is left for the only just judge, which is Christ. But we must judge between what's good and bad. We must follow the prescriptions of what the Lord says to us. And I believe that this was the message that Pope Francis gave a few weeks ago in that interview. That we have more, been more damaging by our condemnation of people. Yes, we still have to judge what's right and wrong. But we've been more damaging because we haven't done the other part of that. We haven't extended the love and the self-restraint. And that's where the mercy comes in. You see, the borderline between judgment and condemnation is that mercy. And mercy will require humility. I mean, what do we want, really? We want everybody to be saved. That's what we want. That's our goal. We want ourselves to be saved. But if we look at the gospel today, it leads us to believe that even if we save thousands of people, that does not guarantee that we're going to save ourselves. We can't do that. Salvation is a gift. That's why St. Paul, again in another place, will say, lest I save others and then I lose my own soul. And so we can't guarantee our salvation by saving souls. It's a free gift. And this is how the grace of... And so the apostles in the gospel today ask one thing of our Lord. Increase our faith. So now they're in the boat with us too. It's Habakkuk, the prophet, it's us, and now the apostles. Why do they need their faith increased? Because they don't trust. They don't think things are going like they should. They think, is God really up there? Or is he just a disinterested spectator? Kind of orbiting around here saying, eh, they'll get it, more or less. And so they're asking for this gift. Can we just know his plan? And the fact is this. In the end, God's plan does become a reality. It does bear fruit. Whether we approve of his plan or not, it is. Whether we think it's at the right time or not, it will be. His plan becomes reality. Can we screw that up? We can screw it up, but God uses, you know, whatever he can to make these crooked lines straight again. Can we refuse the grace? 
Absolutely, we can refuse His grace, and where we refuse, someone else accepts that grace. Again, it's how He draws straight with these crooked lines. And there are times when we will accept the grace He offers, and others will not. And the fact that we accepted that will make the difference. This is how the saints got their start. There's this wonderful book uh, by Robert Ellsberg. It's called The Saint's Guide to Happiness. Practical Lessons in the Life of the Spirit. And he goes on to speak about how this occurs. A life in which there is no breath of love is a miserable existence. Like a plant without sufficient water, it may exist in some desiccated state, but it cannot flourish. At the same time, there is, at the center of each of us, a secret identity, unknown even to ourselves, that lies sleeping, awaiting the kiss of the beloved to awaken at last. That kiss may take many forms. Sometimes it is the love of another person whose existence invites us into a world that is suddenly noble and beautiful. For St. Francis of Assisi, it was the kiss of a leper. For St. Anthony of Egypt, it was a reading from scripture that stirred him as never before. For St. Catherine of Genoa, it was the sense of being truly forgiven. However love enters our lives, it calls us to our better selves, makes us braver, kinder, more forgiving, more ashamed of our failures, more resolute in our efforts to endure. He goes on to quote uh, Father Zosima, love in action is a harsh and dreadful thing compared to love in dreams. We do not learn to love by daydreams. We learn to love by loving. In the words of Theophan, the recluse, one of the early desert fathers, you say that you have no humility or love. So long as these are absent, everything spiritual is absent. Humility is acquired by acts of humility. Love by acts of love. Acts of love repeated daily establish the habit of love. What begins with a conscious effort may become with practice a certain attitude toward life. As our character is molded by charity, it forms our response to every situation and encounter. But we le don't learn to love by daydreaming or reading a book. We learn how to love by love. It is no longer about me. It changes our whole motivation. It's no longer about what I do for God, but how I allow the Spirit to use me to bring others to God. And this is the moment. There is a, a word in Greek for time, kairos. There's the word chronos, which is like one o'clock, two o'clock, but then there's kairos, and kairos means the moment, one particular moment. Now, I've been a high school chaplain for more than eight years, and in that time I preached to these kids, I talked to these kids one-on-one, -on -one, I taught in their classrooms, I exhorted them to many different things in the faith. Couldn't get through. To many of them, couldn't get through. And they went on this retreat we have in, in high school called Kairos, the moment. And in that loving and safe environment, relationships formed. And there was a turn. That for the first time, maybe in their life at that point, they experienced a real, a really real God. And it was through love and safety and trust that they were able to experience that moment, that kairos. Remember what the Lord says. If it delays, wait for it. 
It will surely come. It will not be too late. It came at the right time. It came at the moment that they needed that. And that's what the Lord is trying to get across to the prophet. And that's what he's trying to get across to us. That my time will always be the right time. But I will depend on you to make the time right. To set up everything for the perfect storm so that someone might be able to experience me for the very first time. Today, in a special way, we celebrate Respect Life Sunday. That we have a love and respect for all life from a natural beginning to a natural end. But we cannot demand respect for life from people any more than we can demand love for life from people. We can't do that. We can't. What we can do is show them respect and love, even when they don't deserve it. And by showing them that respect and love, the love and self-restraint, the power that comes from the Spirit, then we also show them the face of Christ. And perhaps that is the moment that they're waiting for doesn't mean we turn a blind eye to what's happening in the world, to atrocities anywhere. It doesn't mean that. Jesus never compromised himself. He never turned a blind eye. But he always acted with truth in charity. The two were hand in hand. Not just the truth, but truth in charity. And so it's my perception that our Holy Father understands the workings of God's grace and is open to the power of the Holy Spirit in a way that has made the time right for so many to experience the right time, the moment, the kairos. We are warriors for Christ. We are the militia Christi. And we are on the battlefield of the world. But we're also diplomats. And the Holy Spirit gives us the gifts we need to know when diplomacy is the better part of valor. Remember, as clever as serpents, as innocent as dogs.